The body's been designed to be interfaced to the external world. Um, we don't have an adequate internal surveillance system. Um, so our physicality tends to recede into the background because we're open to the world. Our senses are monitoring our external navigation of, of the space within which we function. As well as uh, uh, the absence that's the result of our interface to the world, um, the absence is augmented by the fact that we often operate uh, mostly automatically and habitually. In fact, we are only conscious of the body. Could we just, there's a bit of a hum with this mic. Could we turn it down a little bit, please? I'm sorry, uh, Dan, just, thanks. <laughs> Right, thanks very much. Okay, so we're absent because we're interfaced and open to the world. We're absent because we're automatic and habitual. And in fact, awareness often doesn't surface until we malfunction, um, until we fall ill and the physicality of the body surfaces. In fact, one can say a, a cynical definition of awareness is that which happens when you malfunction. And since I'm increasingly malfunctioning, I look forward to increasing awareness. <laughs> um, uh, next slide, please. <laughs> So this condition of being absent in the world um, relegates us to act as if we were only minds immersed in metaphysical fogs, navigate, navigating space, but with our physicality always receding. Um, what happens though too is that we're not only absent in the world, we're also now profoundly obsolete in the technological terrain that we've created, in the, um, in, the, uh, in the fact that we can't match the performance, the precision and the speed of the machines which we've made, and the fact that we've generated now, uh, or technology generates a speed in us that accelerates the body to attain planetary escape velocity. All of a sudden the body finds itself in an, in an immense extraterrestrial space, the body cannot cope um, its softness, its wetness, its complexity um, is not really suited to environments off this biosphere. So the body now has become profoundly obsolete. I can only do minutes without air, uh, maybe a week or two without water, perhaps as long as a month without food. My survival parameters are very slim if my internal temperature varies a few degrees, I'm in serious trouble. If I lose 10% of my body fluids, I'm dead. So the parameters of the body, the physicality of the body, um, are very delicate ones. Now, do we accept the biological status quo? Or, realising the obsolescence of the body, we come up with strategies to redesign it. Um, the performances um, that you see at the moment are performances that really were det about determining the limitations of the body's uh, physical uh, condition. Um, these were situations where the body was suspended um, in various locations, in different structures, um, and uh, where the skin was stretched now, we've stretched the skin, we can now probe the internal parts of the body. Um, the, the skin as a, as a significant site is no longer. Um, 
what's important is not the psyche, uh, not the skin as sight for the social and for political inscription, but rather considering the structure of the body as the meaningful thing that we must now examine. Um, no longer seeing the, ob uh, the body as an object of desire, but to consider the, the body uh, as an object for designing. So circadian rhythms subside in the complexity of these new cyber systems. Humans increasingly inhabit a zone of erasure. Absolute, absent, obsolete and invaded bodies proliferate, facilitating the vanishing. But this is not a vanishing of humanity away, but rather a vanishing to something else. In other words, the body is not something that we can discard altogether. When I say the body is profoundly obsolete, it's this particular body with these forms and functions which has to be re-examined. Um, I once gave a presentation at Stanford and having declared the obsolescence of the body, uh, someone stood up and, and indicated that it just might be my own particular problem <laughs> and no one else's. Um, but I think it is, it is a situation where, where if we want to interface with this um, technolog technological terrain that's been created, we really need to redesign the body and redefine what it means to be human. What it means to be human is no longer, nor probably it ever was, a purely biological uh, organism. Ever since we were hominids, um, but developed by pedal locomotion, two limbs become manipulators. With manipulators, we make tools, instruments, artifacts. So one can very well argue that the beginning of, um, of, of defining what it means to be human has always been coupled to the technologies that we've made. So technology isn't an alien other. It has always been coupled to the body and it always functions with the body, constantly redefining it and uh, possibly now redesigning it. So to be human will no longer be determined by genetic containment, but by being reconfigured uh, with electronic circuitry. Now, the body plugged into an extended technological system creates a situation where we can extrude the intelligence of the body into the system. Intelligence no longer merely resides in the location of this particular biological body, but rather technology is dispersed and extruded and becomes uh, an operational component in a greater system. Notions of species evolution, gender distinction, are remapped and redefined in, a, in alternate hybridities of human machine. Spoken tongues are stilled by the hum of the hybrid. Consider a body that is structured, not as one free agent, but whose functions are determined by multiple and spatially separated agents. Um, my body's connected to a, a, a muscle stimulator system with a touch screen interface. Could we just continue just slow, every couple of seconds changing slides? And with this muscle stimulation system, it's now possible to compute a choreograph the movements of the body. In other words, your body moves involuntarily. Your body moves in space. You've neither initiated that movement, nor are you yourself contracting your muscles to do that. If this can be um, extended to a remote activation of the body, if my body in Melbourne can be remotely activated by your body in Warwick, 
in effect what would be happening is that your movements here would be manifested in my body there. My body would manifest another agent from another place. But of course you may not be the only agent making my body move. The possibility is that we could have multiple agents moving the body. So in this sort of situation, the authenticity of, 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 of being a person may no longer reside in the integrity of, the indiv of your individuality, but rather in the multiplicity of agents that your, that your body could propagate. This would result, in fact, in a physically split body. And whereas the problem before perhaps was about split personalities, now it's about split physicalities. Whereas before the problem was a mind-body duality, now the problem is a body-species split. As bodies diversify and are redesigned, um, they no longer uh, function in the same way uh, in the human phylum as they now do. Imagine then that the physically split body may have one arm gesturing involuntarily. Can we just hold that slide? Go back to that. Okay. Um, the physically split body may not ha uh, may have one arm gesturing involuntarily, remotely actuated by, by an unknown transmitter, whilst the other arm might be enhanced by an exoskeleton to perform exquisite with, with exquisite precision and extreme speed. This augmented body might have a vision that would not merely scan the external world but might be augmented and adjusted to a parallel virtuality which increases in intensity to compensate for the twilight of, of, of its primal environment. So vision need not only be limited to scanning the external world, but might in fact be augmented by a virtual vision superimposed, heads up display, whatever you'd like to call it, um, where perhaps data could be read, uh, where perhaps alternate worlds could be simultaneously explored in parallel domains. Can we rewind that because I think that was shown, um, uh, fast forward and keep fast forwarding it because it's a... Uh... Okay. Um, as well as talking about absent and involuntary bodies, uh, bodies have now also been invaded um, a performance I did in Ars Electronica um, a few years ago was a performance where uh, the body uh, with sounds amplified and uh, with third hand attached inserted an endoscope into its stomach so it could interactively switch from live images uh, between its internal and external uh, uh, spaces. And the image there is an image of the inside of the stomach. Um, uh, and this was done standing up without any sort of medical assistance. Um, and uh, in this performance, which lasted about uh, an hour, um, about 60 or 70 uh, centimetres of internal space was explored. Uh, the fast, the fast forward that we're seeing are performances with um, robots, uh, which provided an external surveillance system. The body had. Um, let's play a little bit of this. Um, the body had uh, sensors on its arms, legs, and head, um, and by tilting its head, lifting its leg, lifting its arms, it it could become the, the video switcher as well as the vision mixer. So what you're seeing here on the videotape are live um, performance edits uh, using sensors on the body. 
Um, these were not edits done in the studio. Um, so the choreography of the performance um, is, is connected to the structure of the gestures that it makes, the internal physiology and the condition that it finds itself throughout the performance. And uh, in this case, we also had laser eyes modulated to the heartbeat sound. That close-up image is, in fact, the camera on the robot arm. And that's, uh, we're switching to that uh, uh, robot image. The body is standing in the task envelope of the robot. Uh, this is not a very safe thing to do. Um, because the, um, what happened in this performance, which was extremely uh, disconcerting at the time, was that although we pre-programmed the robot to scan and rotate around the body seemingly safely, because we wanted to interactively control the robot, and because the body was interfaced to the, to the uh, computer controller, what we found out accidentally and rather late in, in preparations was that when I interrupted the robot to insert my own subroutines and the robot played out those subroutines, it wanted to go back to the point of interruption of its program. And it does this taking the shortest possible path <laughs> in the quickest possible way. Um, so what began as this sort of programmed robot, and, and as long as I didn't sort of sway from my position, I was theoretically safe, um, all of a sudden turned out to be a rather uh, disconcerting situation where, in fact, half my movements were sort of controlling the robot, and the other half were weaving out of the way, trying to avoid uh, being hit. Uh, can we have the next overhead transparency, please? The videotape now shows um, uh, last year's uh, stomach uh, sculpture probe. Um, I designed a sculpture for the inside of the body. Uh, this is an electronic capsule that was inserted. It was tethered um, uh, on, a, on, a one, uh, on a one meter, 50 centimeter long cable to a control box um, and there was a servo motor and a logic circuit um, uh, controlling this uh, uh, sculpture. Um, it had to be safely inserted, so the safe uh, structure was this capsule. But once it was inserted into the stomach, the capsule could be opened, it would extend and retract, it had a flashing light and a beeping sound. <laughs> so this sort of operational object um, sort of invaded the body, uh, inhabited this sort of wet, soft, and alien space. Initially, I thought that, um, well, you know, since the, the uh, stomach contents are, are mildly hydrochloric ac acidic in content, um, if I had some copper components as part of this sculpture, I might be able to generate a primitive battery that would... Um, <laughs> That, that would charge the light. Um, unfortunately, I found out very quickly that um, I would end up having a copper-coated stomach um, if we pursued that process, so that was uh, dropped. Um, it also reminds me of a, of a, of a rather interesting uh, uh, story. When I first made the film of the inside of the left and right bronchi of the lungs, and I realised that the trachea was a wind tunnel. You know, you breathed air up and down the trachea, and it was a wind tunnel. So I thought, at that time, we had the oil, you know, the oil crisis, <laughs> and the concern about energy conservation. And I thought, well, if I could implant a little propeller device in the trachea, and through my regular breathing, I could, in fact, generate some elect electricity and this could be stored in a battery and this could run my third hand um, this would be a rather wonderful solution um, so I, I visited my robotics friend at Tokyo Institute of Technology and so I said well I said well you know could you calculate how, how much energy I could generate from a breath from breathing and he sat down and calculated and as he calculated he smiled and and he looked up at the end and he said well, it was very very small and I forget the actual um, technical um, specification, but it was something like 0.01 microwatts of energy. 
Now that seemed very small at the time, but I didn't understand what it meant. So um, I said, well, how long would it take then of, of, of constant breathing to charge one of these little transistor batteries? And so he sat down and calculated and um, his smile sort of broke into a laugh. And he said, well, with heavy breathing, it'd take about a hundred years. <laughs> So um, that idea was discarded. <laughs> you can imagine this light bulb sort of like <laughs> coming on. <laughs> um, but we did come up with an idea of an exoskeleton device uh, which would take over the antagonistic functions of, 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 of the leg muscles. And with such a device, theoretically, one could climb up a hill, one could climb up a hill, one could actually save energy climbing up the hill, but the long-term problem of this would be atrophy of your, of, of your antagonistic muscles, which again, from, from the point of view, let's go back on those, uh, uh, those last four slides, please. Okay, so this is the size of the sculpture fully opened uh, you can see the little flashing light at the top of the uh, dome, near the dome. And um, it had, we had to, the idea here was to insert an artwork into the body. And this was designed for the 5th Australian Sculpture Triennale, whose theme was site-specific works. <laughs> And uh, being a performance artist and never being invited to a sculpture triennale, um, I finally convinced them that it wouldn't take up any museum space <laughs> and um, it would not be very costly to manufacture because um, it was so small. But in fact, I had to get the assistance of a microsurgery instrument maker because the components in that, uh, in that mechanism uh, were too small even for a jeweller to make and they were actually made under magnification uh, but um, because of a, of a, of a friend uh, inter uh, acting as an intermediary uh, he, he did it for, for very little cost. Next slide. Um, you can see that the stomach probe um, in involved uh, a couple of cables there. One is the control cable and the other one is the endoscope which recorded the, the uh, what we see there. Um, very soon we'll be making a second internal stomach sculpture. This time the electronic components uh, will be inserted separately. There'll be eight or nine electronic components inserted individually and we've worked out a magnetic coupling system and once all these, are com these components are safely inside the stomach using endoscopic instruments and of course with medical assistance will be able to assemble the sculpture so it becomes a much bigger structure than is possible to to swallow and uh, this structure will have uh, a, a light circuit for, for a, a, an array of flickering LEDs um, a sound, actually several sound circuits uh, to produce uh, beeping and, and, and rasping sounds and it'll, it'll have some kind of vibrator, uh, vibratory movement as well. Uh, the problem I think will not be so much um, assembling the object uh, because the, the magnetic coupling enables it to be sort of assembled in one, in one way only. Uh, the problem will be just, just sort of pulling it apart so we can remove the individual components. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a clean shot of the inside of the stomach. And next shot. And uh, actually, when when I did the first stomach probe uh, quite a number of years ago, um, the story to tell about that one was that uh, there was um, while we, while we were doing the probe, uh, the the doctor who was helping discovered a polyp growing in my stomach. So what began as this artistic experiment quickly deteriorated into a medical melodrama and we had to perform a biopsy there and then and uh, I had to wait for a few days to discover um, uh, whether it was benign or not. So um, 
the idea then of invaded bodies becomes a real possibility, not only in terms of implanted uh, medical components, but also um, the adornment of the internal body with aesthetic objects. Um, also, of course, uh, with nanotechnology, with the, micro, with the radical micro-miniaturisation of technology, there is the possibility of colonising the body or recolonising the body with micro-miniaturised robots to augment our bacterial population and viral population. Um, these, this colony of internal robots might act as a surveillance system for the body. At the moment, there's a, a gap between you know, cellular activity and conscious awareness. Uh, we, we might be sitting here with tumours growing in our bodies. We will not be aware of them until the symptoms surface, and that's generally too late. So uh, an internal surveillance system um, makes sense. Uh, these, these internal robots also might be able to radically redesign the body. We think of redesigning the body as a very traumatic cyborgian event you know, like organs ripped out, replaced by large technological components, a rather inelegant way of, of, of sort of patching the body together again. But imagine a colony of micro-miniaturised nanorobots who could redesign the body atoms up, inside out. You would probably not sense them functioning in the internal cellular uh, spaces of your body and you may not even recognise the gradual tra transformation that's occurring. So uh, that becomes a real radical strategy for the notion of, of, of redesigning the body. Next slide, please. Um, in this past uh, year or so, I've done performances where the body has been completely computer choreographed. And uh, these slide images show a performance in Melbourne. Next slide. What we have here is a body that's split vertically. Um, in fact, uh, can we now have the next... Um, Uh, we now have a situation where the body can be split, sp uh, split vertically, uh, where uh, we have a voltage in, voltage out situation. On the one side, voltage in produces the involuntary or remote, uh, remotely activated motions. On the other side, electrodes picking up internal signals produce a voltage out situation where you can operate a third hand or other technological sort of devices. So the body can be split. Now, if we, for example, were both dancers and we both had the, the, the technology, uh, the movements happening in my body could be manifested in half of your body and the movements that you would be making in your body could be manifested in, in the other half of my body. Um, this sort of novel physical in interaction uh, can now be transduced um, over long distances of course and in November we'll be doing an internet upload of the body where and this is only a schematic diagram it's not uh, of course technically correct there's not enough room to, to show all the devices needed but effectively you've got a computer uh, touch screen interface to the muscle stimulation system by touching the muscle sites of the, of the computer model, it's possible to program the movements of the body. Um, these uh, serial port signals then control the circuitry in the muscle stimulator and uh, then these signals are, tr are transmitted um, via internet. There are various ways of doing it. And so theoretically then anyone in any place uh, might uh, activate your body. The notion here though, as a clarification, isn't so much that uh, the desire is for remotely controlling a body, but rather the idea that 
um, a physical motion or a physical action can be displaced from one body to another body in another place. Or I could complete a choreography from this body to that body, uh, from Melbourne to London. Um, it's the displacement of physical motion rather than the notion of a kind of cyber voodoo remote, remote activation of the body that, that, that's, um, that's the driving uh, intention for this. The performance on the videotape is a performance at V2 and again the editing that you see is a live edit um, with the body having sensors on its head, legs and arms. And um, the stimulation signals at that point were only PC uh, driven and so you've only got a simple graphical interface. We've got a, a nice sort of nervous motion programmed into the robot so whenever I access the robot camera I can, I can image that, that uh, nervous movement. Um, and I can also superimpose and split the images live during the performance simply by the sensors, um, using the sensors on the body. Uh, that's the performance at, at V2, in fact. Next slide. Uh, there was a large video screen above the, above the body, so there was this interplay between the physical presence of the body and the robot and its uh, video images above. Can we fast forward that, please? Next slide. Next slide. Okay. Uh, this is the constructed um, computer model. Um, the graphics aren't fantastic, but what we tried to do was develop a system where we could just use a, a normal PC or an or a off-the-shelf Mac um, Yes, I'll oh, actually rewind that a little bit, I'm sorry. Rewind that a little bit, that's the next performance. Okay, right. Um, this performance is a, a clip of the performance recently done in, in, in Montreal. And um, there, was lots, there was lots problematic about this performance. The body was computer choreographed for the whole hour that it performed. So an involuntary body had a motion capture system which enabled it to interactively control a virtual body. So you have here an involuntary body activating a virtual body trying to avoid a programmed robot. Um, the, mo uh, the motion capture, instead of a kind of simple mimicry which would result in, in simple, uh, simply um, using a seven sensor flock of birds or, or a Polima system, we did map virtual camera views to the virtual body. So for example, every time I lifted my arm, my left arm up and down, or in other words, every time the computer elevated my left arm, it rotated the virtual body on its horizontal axis. If I made a 90 degree movement with my right arm, it rotated the virtual arm, uh, the virtual body, 360 degrees. We also had a depth cue, so the virtual sort of sort of uh, space was a thin slice. So, for example, if I swayed my body backwards and forwards, the virtual body would appear and disappear, uh, uh, superimposed on the other video images. And we also had a breath warping capability. A little microphone picked up the breathing and whenever the body breathed heavily, the virtual body would warp. Its body form would quiver and change shape. So there was depth cue, virtual camera mapping and a breath warping um, a series of actions. And uh, although this is a short clip and it's not a professionally shot one, you can get some idea of the different sorts of motions. The pre-programmed robot motion, um, the involuntary movement of the body, the triggered uh, action of the third hand, which is controlled by muscle signals, and the virtual body, uh, some of the virtual body actions. So none of these uh, movements are, are voluntary. 
We also had uh, laser eyes, again modulated to the heartbeat sound. The idea that vision can be uh, active, that vision could, can create images rather than simply passively receive them. Uh, by blinking and moving my eyes, it was possible to scribble in the space to generate some, some images using the laser eyes. Um, the object that you were looking at was connected to your body by the laser beam. Um, when we look at an object, we caress it, we project uh, to it, and um, the laser beam then becomes this visual um, uh, um, um, connection to the object that, that your gaze is, is reaching out for. Okay, thanks. And uh, can I put on the second video, please? Um, now, I'd like to start uh, demonstrating this um, muscle stimulation system, but before we uh, hook it up, uh, can we just have, uh, well, no, maybe we'll have the lights as they are for now, and uh, could you operate the computer for me, okay, and uh, let's go back to, return to the, uh, to the previous one. So, uh, this program, as I said, is, is modest in its graphics. Uh, but we didn't have a, an Indigo Extreme or an Onyx to run it. Uh, we just wanted to use a normal PC or a Power Mac. Um, and um, uh, uh, we have here several possibilities for programming movement. Um, we can go to the touch screen, which we have to simulate by clicking the mouse. And by clicking the muscle side, if you can click the uh, bicep there, yeah, you click that. Um, the body will behave accordingly and, and the, the flesh will turn red where the muscle is activating. So what happens then uh, is that that signal is uh, transmitted to the stimula uh, stimulation box and my body moves accordingly. Um, can, you touch some, can you touch the leg, leg muscle as well? Uh, if we click the leg muscle, uh, we can generate... Uh, can we have improvise on as well, please? Okay, again, click the leg again. Ordinarily, with a touch screen, it's a much more sort of direct and immediate experience, and you're sort of touching the computer model in the appropriate muscle site to generate the movement. So it's a bit better than clicking a mouse, but we're only simulating that at the moment. Okay, let's go to, um, uh, let's go uh, back to the uh, previous and go to choreography and uh, the other way you can choreograph the body's movements is by pasting from a set of um, gesture icons so if you, you can go ahead and just uh, click a bunch of those and play and um, the um, the motion will uh, uh, will occur now this is a little stilted and obviously, you know, six channels is hopelessly inadequate for any sort of um, subtle motion. I would need five channels just, just to control uh, the individual fingers. And I've only got six channels to play with. Um, but if we, if, we're, if we intelligently place them, position them on large muscle sites like hamstrings and calf muscles, deltoids, flexors and biceps, you can generate very strong movement, strong visual movement uh, with those six channels. You can also see the, um, the stimulator box reacting accordingly and it's switching on um, as the um, signals are changing uh, from the, the computer program. Oh, no, can we play the next tape? This is not, oh, this is the next tape? Oh, okay, can we, right, I think it's here. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, we, we actually went through it. <laughs> Rewind. I got, I got caught, caught up explaining this. And, uh, yeah, play now. Well, I hope that's not too far. Can you play now, please? Uh, Rewind a little more. Okay, this little video clip from there, uh, no, I'm sorry, a little bit further back, I'm sorry. A bit further back. Uh, okay. 
Uh, no, not for the back, sorry. <laughs> Back. It's just there's some nice video imagery of the um, system in play which will augment a slightly dimmer image here. Okay, play that. Well, we've got this, uh, I mean, it's just a, um, a television program, but uh, the, the, the person there has electrodes connected to their muscles and will demonstrate this in a minute. Uh, the, the motions of the third hand then are collectively um, controlled by, uh, by both bodies. Uh, just fast forward a little bit. Okay. Okay. So here we have the um, the computer system, the touch screen, uh, where we can program this directly touching uh, the monitor, and the uh, activated muscle uh, changes into a red colour to indicate an activated muscle, and um, some of the motions that you see. I couldn't fully wire up my body for tonight without sort of uh, you know taking off clothes and things, but. Um, uh, here we have a, a range of movements that are possible. Okay. Can, can we just have all the lights on, please, now? Can someone switch all the lights? The, uh, the light switch is at the uh, corner of the room. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. Can we have the pink lures that are going to help? We did this wire up last year, uh, but it gives a couple of other other people a chance to uh, connect with the, with the hand. sort of a, a sound registration of this so it's uh, more apparent. I'm controlling the, um, the third hand movements, um, the wrist rotation movement by electrodes on the flexor and extender muscles. Now the reason I'm, I'm connecting them here is just that it's, it's a convenient sight. If I want individual movements of the three hands, I would need to uh, put the electrodes, say, on my abdominal and leg muscles. Um, now I can I can just exaggerate the control action. But it's possible to control it, in fact, with no discernible movement. Okay? Um, now if you can uh, try to close the hand. Okay, we, we sort of haven't practiced on this. So, but we are using the normal flexor and extender muscles, which means they're the normal muscles you use, and so it's, there's, there's no training necessary. But if you have these electrodes, say on your uh, abdominal muscles, and they're only four inches apart, uh, you know, to be able to sort of control, you know, one abdominal muscle and then the other is not, not, as, uh, not as easy to do. So let's try opening and closing. And can you sort of hold up your arm so you can see what that's happening? Um, the hand also has a, um, a tactile feedback system. Now remember you can't both contract muscles at the same time. Feel the the, uh, the grasp of the hand. <laughs> it's the only way I get hold. You get hold of it. Yeah. Uh, can I hold your arm instead? Your, your forearm. Okay. Now you've got to close it. And you've got to open it. Open. No, you you relax. You relax. So uh, the gr uh, the grip of the arm is is fairly um, fairly strong. Um, <laughs> Um, and it does have a tactile feedback system, so those little um, uh, sensors on the fingertips um, 
can give you a rudimentary sense of touch. And uh, in fact, I don't usually switch these uh, the tactile feedback system on because it needs another battery pack and another set of sensors. But um, this inability to switch on the tactile feedback system has gotten, gotten me into some trouble. Um, in fact, uh, listening to, um, to uh, uh, the, uh, the poor Rush story yesterday about phantom breasts <laughs> and, uh, and, remote, and remote caressing of breasts, um, I did a, a presentation um, a few years ago in Australia and um, we had a sort of a nervous student sort of standing out front and I was uh, sticking electrodes on her arm and at the same time, of course, my arm, my, my hand was moving um, as, I, as I was putting the electrodes on. I did notice, though, that she was uh, becoming rather irritated and her eyes started sort of glancing from side to side. And uh, as I followed her eyes down, I realised that my third hand was really going to town <laughs> on her right breast. Um, <laughs> Of course, it was terribly embarrassing for both of us because I couldn't feel anything. And um, she was feeling this rather cold alien uh, mechanism. Um, but uh, 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 the, uh, the tactile feedback system here is capable of distinguishing between, uh, for example, uh, a, a paper cup so that you wouldn't sort of crush it even if you picked it up in, in the dark, um, and, uh, and sort of the brittleness, say, of an egg. Uh, th actually, the most interesting tactile feedback system that I know of, I think has been developed uh, in Southampton, uh, here in the UK, where there's a, uh, I think there's a, 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 a slip sensor. So, in other words, when you go to pick up an object, you know, um, uh, it, only, it will only require the minimum pressure to hold it. Because as you pick up the object and lift your arm, if, if, it be, if the object begins to slip, the hand automatically tightens a little bit. So the, 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 sort of the closing function of the hand is connected to the slip sensor. And that means that you're guaranteed the minimum pressure um, when you pick up an object, and I thought that was a very, very um, a clever solution to this tactile feedback problem. Okay, do you want to sort of... Um... unit. I, I've got three sets of electrodes on flexor, biceps and deltoids, which means uh, my, my, uh, my wrist and fingers will, will curl inwards, uh, my arm bends and lifts, and depending on the sequence of, of that operation will uh, partly determine the nature of the movements. But before I do that, there's someone who's wired up who can... Um, sort of indicate what it's like um so this this is just a small unit um, the difficulty of uh, directly plugging someone into this one is that it really needs to be tuned to your body uh, because at a, at a lower voltage the system is a kind of a body prompting system uh, you feel that your arm is beginning to bend uh, but uh, but you can resist it at a higher stimulation level though, it becomes a body actuating system, your body involuntarily moves. And it's very important to uh, um, register uh, the correct uh, voltage, not only for individual muscle sites, but when these um, are firing simultaneously, there is a summation that occurs. And so what was uh, 
sort of initially a 30 or a, or a 40 volt stimulation might add up to a 50 volt stimulation which will um, uh, probably uh, generate some grimaces on my face when we do this one here. So I'll, I'll just ask for him to, to keep his arm relaxed uh, until something begins to happen. See his arm sort of uh, beginning to lift. Obviously, a more complex motion that we're generating here. <coughs> and you can sort of, uh, sorry, um, yes. And this is running on its own at the moment. It's all fully switched. Uh, a lot of G's. So we'll now have a correlation soon with the uh, movements there. But the other thing that you have to remember is that we're, we've done a little bit of remapping and rewiring. Um, I don't have all the electrodes on, so all you're seeing is my arm movements. sort of interested in and what was the setup with the uh, the physical and the virtual body is a situation where the kinesthetics of the physical body are transduced to the kinem kinematics of the virtual body um, so from sort of mass and muscle and gravity and resistance um, in, the, in the in the sort of physical space that you're operating in um, in a virtual space that's translated to a smoother mathematical um, kinematic motion. So in November, if you um, there will be a, a, a web a website with information about this performance um, in November when we upload the body to the internet so um, if you have access uh, to, an, uh, to an internet um, address then uh, perhaps you can um, participate in, in, in this performance which will be a sort of a, a choreography which is both local and, and global uh, collapsed in one body um, the possibility of multiple agents moving you know in one place in one body even though they're spatially separated
thanks very much, and um, if there's time for questions. Uh, yes? So you're going to be doing another stomach sculpture in a few weeks. Uh, London, if so, where it works. <laughs> oh, well, um, it, it's, 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 it's been done privately. And, uh, I mean, there are lots of problems involved, both medical and otherwise. Um, and uh, because of the necessity for using specialist equipment, um, the endoscopy equipment and, and otherwise, um, uh, we can't really uh, we can't really say. Okay. Uh, yes, Rachel. Well, uh, actually, that was a design dilemma: which which hand to attach the the um, the third hand to. Uh, but but originally, um, the drawings were for in fact four arms. Uh, but having cost uh, ten thousand dollars of my own money in four years to construct one, <laughs> uh, we never got got to building the second one. So um, there wasn't meant to be a kind of a a bias to one side of the body or the other. Uh, but generally speaking, I mean, I, I am right-handed, so uh, that is the stronger side, and this has to carry the, uh, the more weight. So there were just simple ergonomic reasons uh, for doing that. Uh, but, but otherwise, uh, there was no sort of, um, you know, uh, in, any special reason otherwise. Uh, yes? Uh, have you ever thought of having yourself a biogenesis um, <laughs> well, genetically re-engineered. <laughs> um, well, I think, I mean, sort of medically and, and otherwise, I think we, we're sort of a long way before sort of we do, we do serious experiments. But to tell a little story about that one, uh, which, which isn't really analogous, but, but it's, it's loose enough to tell it. Um, I gave a presentation in Hamburg about uh, a month ago, a month and a half ago now, and um, we were talking about sort of human machine symbiosis and um, um, implanting sort of technology into the body and and one of the girls sort of got very excited about this possibility and sort of stood up and said and said well you know if uh, if you could have a brain implant uh, you know would you have a brain implant and um, so I sort of thought about it a minute and I thought well I don't know about a brain implant but I'd like a hair transplant <laughs> 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 what it feels like. Um, uh, the, the stimulation or the... <laughs> Are you interested? <laughs> <laughs> we can do full body stimulation. <laughs> um, well, as I said, at a, at a lower at a at a lower voltage, it is it is just a pleasurable tingle. And uh, as the voltage is, is increased, it's more a matter of you getting used to the, the sensation rather than strictly saying that it's painful. I mean, you'd have to sort of really, really turn up the voltage over 60, 70 volts to, to feel any sort of real strain in your muscles. Uh, but certainly after a performance of an hour, uh, you're very fatigued and, you know, you, you know, your body's very stiff for a few days. Uh, it's had a very, very intense workout. So, um, um, yeah, so, it, so, so the feelings, I mean, but, but for me, I guess that's indicative of the fact that um, what I'm really interested in is not sort of reporting my personal subjective sort of uh, likes or dislikes for doing things or even 
I mean, I'm even sceptical about, you know, reporting my subjective, um, you know, stories related to the suspension events. Um, it's, very diff it's very easy to become very loose and, uh, uh, and, and exaggerate those experiences. Uh, but I think, um, I think the interesting thing about doing performance work is that you have to couple expression with experience and you have to take uh, the physical consequences for your ideas. So it's not just simply a theoretical, and, and some of these ideas that I've talked about today are not from a, a, theori a theoretical standpoint or they've sort of emanated from, from these performances. Yes? Well, I think over a long period of time, that's precisely what you do when you ordinarily condition a new skill. I mean, at the moment, I'm learning to touch type because um, it's frustrating, uh, you know, when you're working with computers all the time and, uh, you know, you've been using a couple of fingers and, uh, and you want to feel a bit more symbiotic with, with the keyboard. Um, and, and, of course, I'm sort of practicing about 20, 20 minutes a day. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you know what you're supposed to do and your fingers don't do it and other times your fingers do it but on the wrong keys. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, but uh, it is possible, theoretically, and given that you would have a 30-channel muscle stimulator instead of a 6-channel muscle stimulator, that you could condition a skill from one body to another body remotely. Or, if your body was not in a hazardous location, it would be advantageous of me to borrow a part of your body to borrow your arm, it would be more advantageous to remotely activate your arm and perform a physical task in your space than it would be to remotely activate a robot because your arm is connected to another arm, you know, and a mobile and intelligent body. So once uh, this sort of physical actuation system is, is, more, is more fully developed, um, yes, there may be uh, quite advantageous situations where um, uh, uh, hooking up to another physical body um, it makes more sense than, than uh, a, a robot manipulator. Yes. The, um, the skill of, uh, um, of a, a complicated movement involves cerebellar learning, and um, if you're going from one body to the other, I mean you're just working peripherally to the muscles. Yes. So if you're not using the cerebellum at all, I mean, how that happen? Well, I think that might be mapped onto it because I think, um, you know, when you're learning a skill like, you know, playing squash or like any sort of a sport or, uh, I mean, effectively, you, you have to sort of, it's not enough to know what to do. You have to physically condition your body. And then through those physical actions, you kind of cerebrally map. I mean, I'm not a... <laughs> I mean, I, I might sound very expert here, but... <laughs> I know nothing about this <laughs> from a medical sense, but I figure this is a, fa a fairly good guess at what happens, you know, that, um, yes, if you perform the physical action long enough, you know, you would cerebrally sort of map the kind of the space, the task envelope within which your body is functioning, and you would get this sort of... Um, cerebral kind of <coughs> mapping occurring. Um, but what's intriguing for me, you see, is that um, um, I'm no longer simply uh, um, and simplistically an individual with kind of, kind of one mind and one body, but rather that a body may become a medium for multiple spatially separated agents to function within and, and through. And through. Um, and I find this an exciting possibility. Yes. Well, if your hand starts moving involuntarily tonight, I've got nothing to do with it. <laughs> well, actually, I, I once... I once did a, a remote uh, activation with uh, a remote control performance with my third hand where the third hand was actually attached to another host body in Tokyo and I was in my Yokohama studio and we transmitted my muscle signals to Tokyo and uh, I, I activated the third hand attached to another body. 
And um, in that, uh, uh, but to sort of do some testing for that, I tried to convince my friends in Tokyo to take the hand, the mechanical hand, home for, it for the night so we could do this sort of remote testing. No one would take it home. Um, now, as, as if, as if this third hand had legs. I mean, if they put it on the table, that's where it would stay. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes, Reg. If I ever use drugs, well... <laughs> My friend Manuel de Landa. <laughs> um, well, no, no, I, I guess. Um, well, well, I, I, I did do the usual things growing up in the late sixties, early seventies. So, I mean, I've, I've taken a sort of a potpourri of sort of acid and dope and and smoke. I'm sorry. No. Steroids, no. Do I look good? <laughs> 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 uh, yes. Have you ever been offered wild sums of money by the US military? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I think it's inevitable that a question like that is, is asked because um, obviously, you know, one can see all sorts of, you know, devious and cynical ways one could apply like this sort of technology um, but to me it would be no different than any other sort of um, uh, uh, conditioning of the body uh, uh, um, either by, by sort of uh, uh, social cultural religious or, or other technological means I mean things come and go I mean I mean you know uh, um, uh, to travel a hundred kilometers an hour in a car we have to sit pacified. Our bodies are anaesthetized. Um, we have a, you know, a, 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 a seat belt strapping us down. We can only move the wheel a few degrees one way or the other and stay on the road. Um, and we can only press the pedal a few degrees up and down. So in other words, um, uh, yeah, our body in this case is pacified, but it can travel 100 kilometers an hour. Sitting in front of a computer, we only use our fingers to tap the keyboard, but we can process megabytes of information. Um, so, uh, yeah, there are possible uh, sort of, you know, cunning and, 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 and devious uses of, 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 of any new technology. Um, but, I, I mean, I, I think the best thing for artists is to, to find creative and interesting uses, and I think, in general, this provides interesting interactive physical possibilities between bodies in remote places and that's the general premise of it and it's and it's the aesthetic of displacing physical motion the transduction from kinesthetics to kinematics back out to kinesthetics again yes how, how much uh, consideration have you given to uh, medical therapeutic uh, benefits well you see I, i'm sure uh, there are and i know there are um, you know, medical institutes and university departments that have already done research that enables the programming of a paraplegic to walk using similar technology, right? Um, of course, at the moment, they're tethered to a large computer and they still need um, something for balancing. Uh, um, in fact, um, uh, Professor Kato at Waseda University, when he made his first walking robot uh, he said that the robot took two steps only. It took like one step forward and then it fell over sideways. <laughs> um, and he developed a system whereby the torso was oscillating and thereby uh, producing sort of balance with bipedal robots. But you know the latest uh, strategy that's overcome this oscillating torso, which is rather inelegant, is he's found out that if the legs do this, the robot can walk bipedally and keep its balance. It swings its leg like this. <laughs> and this is, uh, this is dynamically a balanced way of moving for a bipedal robot. So bipedal robots may not quite walk uh, the, way, the way we, we may walk. But you know, the realm of, of, of the, you know, the, the post-human as a cyborg future 
may, may well be, be modified. Because imagine a virtual, a virtual body that is increasingly imbued with an artificial intelligence, which results in increasing autonomy. Uh, this increasingly intelligent and, and autonomous virtual body would, would become operational and its interaction with, with the physical body much more subtle. Um, an autonomous and intelligent image might become operational. The realm of the post-human may well reside not in the realm of the cyborg, but in the realm of intelligent images. The procedures to which the body has been subjected have been described entirely in the passive. <laughs> has a conscious decision been made by the speaker? Uh, yeah. well, well, in fact, I, I, it is conscious now, uh, obviously, but, but over a period of sort of 14 or 15 years in doing these performances, I, I guess the reasons were rather mundane. Firstly, in talking about performance, you don't want to keep referring to you know, your body all the time. I mean, it's, it's, it gets a, a little embarrassing. Um, but, but secondly, uh, all of these performances are not structured for experiences um, for, a, for a personal body. In other words, the body suspended in space is not necessarily this body. Um, and, and I don't see it... Uh, I mean, I guess it just goes with my notion of viewing the body as an evolutionary structure rather than uh, as, as, as a psyche. Um, so I, I much prefer to... I mean, we've spent 2,000 years prodding and poking the psyche. Uh, I think our f philosophy is fundamentally grounded in our physiology, and I think the, the sooner we examine uh, the physical structure of the body, uh, you know, the, the better. Yes? Your work's obviously moving towards uh, a possible full remote control of the body. Um, don't you feel that that has moral implications? Do you, do you not accept moral implications within your work? Well, I would suspect that there'd be a certain sort of uh, decision-making process that would result um, in, in, in a body being remotely activated or me borrowing a part of your body to perform an action in your space. Uh, firstly, you'd have to sort of be convinced, you know, to, uh, to, to apply the electrodes or the, or the particular data suit or stimulation suit that, uh, you know, you were, uh, you, that, that was going to trigger this motion. Then you'd have to plug yourself in. Then you'd have to, um, you know, allow a transmission to, uh, to engage with your, with your system. Uh, so I think there probably would be a series of choices which uh, would, you know, possibly prevent that, unless you're hardwired from birth. And um, that's an interesting option. <laughs> So coupled with um, the other gentleman's question about the uh, military uses of it, yes. don't you see it as a possible another control system being created from technology? Well, well, perhaps, but I think I think increasing complexity generates increasing control. Now, whether that control is uh, a control that we have some say in, um, as individuals, uh, or partly as individuals. Uh, uh, is, 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 is another thing. So, uh, but, but you see, I, I think that the, the whole notion of what it means to be human, what it means to have a body, and, uh, and um, uh, I mean, the more I do my performances, uh, the less I feel that I have a mind of my own. The mind of, 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 of this body is not simply situated within the biological encapsulation of skin muscle and, 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 and skeletal structure. I mean, mind is a social construct. It, 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 intelligence is, is expressed through behavior, uh, through, through, through uh, the construct of language, um, through history and culture. And I think some of these devious and cunning and militaristic uh, uses that we're coming up with for new technologies is as much an indictment of our original genetic biochemistry that, uh, that it is uh, to some of these new technologies. But, it, but it's a sort of, it's obviously not going to be uh, settled in, in, in a short answer like that. Uh, yes, please. Well, I think. 
<laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think there would be a whole series of functional uses. I think uh, the use of, of this sort of stuff to kind of like get fit is dubious uh, because um, you'd probably... Well, well, perhaps, but I mean, I mean, uh, you know, one one might well argue that you wouldn't get the sort of aerobic sort of uh, effects, the, the stamina. You know, you might increase your sort of muscle bulk, but you wouldn't necessarily, um, you know, improve uh, your staying power. So, but, but but you know, we're not really talking about simply uh, increasing the, like the physical power of the body. In fact, I must say that, that there's, uh, since there are some Australians in this audience, there was a, um, an interview with Virilio in The Last World Art, which was totally bizarre in, in, in terms of uh, the misquotations attributed and the quotes attributed to me. Um, for example, my notions of extended vision were simplistically portrayed as telescopic eyesight, you know, and, uh, and my notions of of redesigning the body, which uh, which include uh, a more elegant, efficient, durable body, are simplistically reduced to a more powerful body, which means you're you're aligned with you know the sort of sci-fi, uh, techno-military, Terminator 2, Robocop stuff. And I mean, this hand was made, for example, this was completed 15 years ago, you know, far before those uh, kind of popularizations in, 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 in movies. So um, my criteria for redesigning the body uh, hasn't got to do, and being an artist, I'm more concerned with, uh, with the sort of aesthetic possibilities of, of, of this new redesign. And, and, and then in addition to this, uh, Virilio with, with, um, with Gaelic gusto also reports that I wanted to enhance my sexual prowess. <laughs> to make love with not one beautiful woman, but many beautiful women. Well, I mean, it's just totally bizarre. And I think if I talk about redesigning the body and someone translates that as creating a master race, or if one wants to imbue a utopian or dystopian future to these speculations, well, I think they're not only disregarding the intention of the artist, but they're really projecting a lot of fantasies onto the actions and the text that the, the artist has written. Yes? I have, I have, um, I can honestly report that, that I, I, I do twitch uncontrollably at times, uh, not, not in a major way, and, uh, and, uh, and not often enough yet that I can attribute this to the muscle stimulation system. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, it seems it's, it's about time. Um, I think that, um, that uh, there will be a, a, a seminar tomorrow um, on, um, on medical bodies. And this will be after Orlan's presentation. So I think um, anyone who wants to pursue some of these m questions in more detail, and especially after seeing Orlan's work as well, uh, can do so in the seminar tomorrow on, on medical bodies. Sorry, you have the address for the web page? Uh, I don't at the moment because it hasn't, hasn't been established, but it will be. And there will be information about uh, how to sort of uh, go about connecting up. Is there an email address for that? Can I just I can that all those stuff starts to be tomorrow, just to remind people what time Yeah, before you all split up, apart from Fantasy Star Art, um, just because it's most people here, there's three people here who we, I think we really need to give our thanks to because they've given 12 months of their lives to all kinds of events. Um, in alpha numerical order, Eric Cassidy, um, Otto Inken, and, and Dan O'Hara have been organising for this event.